All right, we're going to talk about innovation today, something that we are all in the business of. Nana, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. You are truly a friend. And thank you to Jumpstart Ventures and all of today's sponsors for this opportunity. I bring you greetings from Columbus, Ohio, where God lives, where the venture dollars flow in the street, and where talent is so plentiful that people work for free, all right? So come on down to Columbus, Ohio. All my Cleveland people don't get jealous. All right, so I'm joined by four distinguished panelists to help me tackle the theme for this panel, which is building a culture of innovation with proven talent. I will introduce all my panelists. We'll go from your left to the right. And when I'm done with this introduction, guys, I want you guys to go absolutely crazy, all right? Like Justin Bibb just won the presidency, all right? And Cleveland controls the White House. Are you guys ready? All right, here we go. To my immediate left, I have Courtney Marchetti, Director of uh, Talent at Overdrive. Next to her, Gerald Hetrick, CEO of Bezlio. Uh, next to him, Rye Walker, CEO of Tembo. And finally, Scott Knup, COO of uh, Actual. So go crazy for my panel. All right, we got 45 minutes. We're gonna get right to business. Um, but I'd like to start by getting to know you guys. So take a couple minutes, share what you do and what your company does. Sure. Um, I'm Courtney Marchetti. I'm Director of Talent Management for Overdrive. Overdrive is sort of the OG tech startup in Cleveland. Um, we were founded in 1986. Um, and uh, if you don't know us, we are the leading provider of digital media to schools and libraries. So download the Libby app. I was required to say that. Um, so I came to I came to Cleveland in Overdrive by way of Silicon Valley. So um, prior to about six years ago, um, came here, and prior to that, I was leading talent teams at Lyft and at Shutterfly, and so kind of steeped in that Silicon Valley startup culture. And it has been, I think, really remarkable to make that transition and to shift from that startup and technology ecosystem and into this startup and technology ecosystem and to see just how rich and varied and, you know, really exciting it is to be part of the technology community here in Cleveland. Awesome. Hard to follow that one. <laughs> I've come back from Silicon Valley as well on, on a plane when they told me no when I tried to raise money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Gerald Hetrick. I'm the current CEO of Bezlio, which is a, um, a sh workflow productivity platform for manufacturing shop floors. So i um, super excited to be building that here in Cleveland, kind of the heart of the Midwest manufacturing. Uh, previously, I was the CEO of Able, which was another Jumpstart company. Shout out to Jumpstart for an awesome event. This has been great. Um, and uh, I've had, yeah, let's do it. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start stealing Ilio's introduction. I call myself a venture enthusiast, um, kind of a Cleveland, Northeast Ohio venture enthusiast. I love participating in this ecosystem. So I'm uh, really excited about what's happened yesterday and today and later tonight, hopefully really late tonight. Hi, uh, my name is Rye Walker. I am a serial entrepreneur from Cincinnati. Go Bengals, right? No. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> All right, good. There we go. Um, no, uh, uh, I started a company called Astronomer uh, in 2015. Uh, we raised $280 million for that company. Um, I was able to uh, exit via secondary sales during the pandemic. Pretty awesome. Uh, so I got liquid from my startup. Very, you know, the full journey, start to exit with, with money and not exit without money. So um, I, immediately one of my uh, uh, investors, uh, good friend at Benrock, uh, came at me with another startup idea similar to you. They kind of got me out of retirement really quickly. Um, and that's what Tembo. Tembo is a database company. My previous company was a data pipeline uh, company. I'm a longtime developer, um, technical founder, I guess. And um, yeah, excited to be doing it again and excited to be up here and meeting people from Cleveland and the rest of Ohio. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Scott Knup. I am the uh, chief operating officer of Actual. Um, so my background, um, after 20 plus years in the safety of Fortune 50 companies, I made the plunge uh, about seven or eight years ago to join um, our last company, which was a uh, patient big data company in healthcare IT. 
Um, that was Explorus. We had a successful exit to IBM Watson Health um, and Glutton for Punishment, back to do it again with our same founder and our leader and <laughs> our current company, Actual, is focused on, again, big data, but clinician big data. And we've built a, a network of 6,800 data sources where we collect critical data about clinicians and we attempt to accelerate the process of, of getting clinicians patient, uh, to patient side and to bedside and onboarding um, and recruiting faster. It's a, it's a serious problem that we have. Workforce is the number one problem plaguing healthcare right now. And we are uh, smack in the middle of that with our, uh, with our data network and our platform. So pleased to be here and look forward to it, Elio. All right, great. So there are the introductions. Let's get right to work, folks. Uh, capital fuels innovation, we all understand that. If you want to throw a conference and you want founders to show up, just tell them you're going to introduce them to investors, all right? But we're going to try to shift the conversation here and talk about talent, because talent also fuels innovation. So first question, is Ohio, as a state, producing the homegrown talent we need to accelerate innovation? I mean, absolutely. And, you know, in kind of talking before the panel, I told Elia that this is a really timely question for me because I had our head of software development in my office this morning. We're right in the middle of new grad development recruiting, right? It's, it's job fair season and we always bring in a crop of new, fresh developers to kind of fuel our teams and, and fuel that growth. And right now, just recruiting from Ohio State and Kent State and Case, we have more talented developers that we want to hire than we can hire. And these are folks who want to stay here. You know, they, they don't feel the draw, I think, even then a couple of years ago to go to the coasts. They want to be here and they want to be close to family. And, you know, we have, we're seeing that there just is more talent out there than we can even accommodate. Yeah, what's, your, what's your thought on that? Yeah, I think, um, I think the answer is yes. It surely has to, although there's, it's probably nuanced and that there are certain regions that need some help and like we should, we should work hard as a collective, as a macro group of you know, innovative founders and service providers and capital providers to like be intentional about that. Um, you know, if you think about Cleveland specifically, I think we've got great universities and we've got some wonderful legacy startups and a lot of new, you know, um, you know, uh, you know capitals come to the area. But we still have to do a bit of a better job. I mean, the, the, the pandemic taught us that we can democratize the workforce from a salary perspective and from a where you go to work perspective in such a way that people can value things other than just what they're going to get paid to, uh, when they think about where they're going to live. Um, and that helps us because people now think, hey, Cleveland's a great place to live. So... Um, I can get paid anything. I can get paid the same as I was going to otherwise. And now that they're here, they think about, well, maybe I want to work local again. So I, th I, do, th I do think um, we've got, at a macro level in Ohio, wonderful talent. And we, we're see starting to see a burgeoning you know, explosion of youthful, young millennial uh, you know, um, you know, entrance in entry into this type of workforce. But I, I just think we, we can do better. Um, and we, we should continue to try and nurture, and be intentional about nurturing you know, people to stay. Come, come here, grow here, stay here. Yeah, so Rye, um, Courtney is saying, hey, we're seeing an uh, abundance of t homegrown talent. What are you finding in your company? I think at the individual contributor level, it's pretty good. You know, like smart, young developers, um, information is, is democratized too. So like there's devs, there's devs in, in Cleveland that know the same frameworks as the devs in the Valley, you know. Um, I think the, the challenge for me comes higher up, you know, like basically once you get to senior leadership teams, someone who's built out GTM at a scaling startup, like there's very few of those people in our, in Ohio uh, that have been working at an Ohio company. Maybe they worked at some other, you know, West Coast company, uh, came back. But that's my, my challenge is like, and I'm trying to work with uh, University of Cincinnati is my home, you know, home university. So I'm basically saying like we really need to blend all, you know, the technology, art, and business, and, and get these people cross-pollinating to build the leaders. Um, you know, as, as we all, I mean, anyone who's done a startup, you don't get to be compartmentalized and just do your little part, you know, like as soon as a developer is immediately asked to write a blog post, you know, and like be part of the marketing squad. So, um, yeah, I think that um, we're, we've got a good base. I, I'm, I'm excited. I, I, some of the best developers I've ever worked for, or worked with, um, or have worked from, with me uh, are from here. Honestly, a lot of times the, the, the engineers I can get from the Valley are, are 
you know, past their prime, uh, maybe. <laughs> and that's why they're working for an Ohio company, perhaps, you know? But Yeah, yeah past <laughs> their prime. They give us the people that are past their prime. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying I, ha I love it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm a jargon buster, all right? So GTM, what's GTM? Uh, go to market, yeah. Go to market, all so, right. Did yeah. everybody in here know that except me? <laughs> all right, I'm just checking. Okay, great. So, Scott, what are you finding? Are, are we producing enough talent? Yeah, I think producing, yes. I think retention's a problem. Um, you know, certainly we, you know, at, in our company, we've we recruited successfully out of boot camps and early stage developers. It's retaining that talent with remote work. We've seen uh, the ability for talent to be able to leave Ohio for their next endeavor. And so, and, and as you scale up and as you're looking for more senior talent, um, we have had to look outside of the outside of Ohio for for some of that talent, and certainly Ryan in leaders, that's for sure. So, um, so thumbs up on a yes, but retention and keeping the talent in Ohio is a challenge. Yeah. So perfect segue. Um, uh, how many people in the job market want to work for a startup? Oh, anybody? Okay, we got one. <laughs> None of you already have a job. You got to put your hand up. Anybody looking? All right. So now we're going to talk about when people are out there looking. How can you attract those people? Right. So whether they're here and they're in abundance there's still competition for them either way. So I'll start with you, Scott. How are you thinking about attracting and retaining the talent that you do have? Yeah, I think um, the first start with, with our company, right, it's mission-driven. So um, we're very focused on healthcare. We're all impacted by the workforce shortages in healthcare, so we lead with mission. Um, so I don't think we're doing anything unique or clever in attracting, -talent, or, uh, attracting talent. You know, we look for referrals. We look for help from our investor community. Um, certainly employee refer referrals, we reward um, employees for bringing um, referrals into the, into the company. So attracting, you know, it's, we're not doing anything creative there. But I will say during the process of courting prospects to work for us, we are open and transparent. Um, we talk about the challenges of innovation and what we're trying to solve, that we are disruptive. Um, we're looking for disruptive uh, and critical thinkers that are, aren't looking to, uh, they're looking to do things new and different. You know, we, we lead with that level of transparency. And I think that has been in 100% of our uh, interview cycles, they all comment on transparency as being an important piece and tapping into what we're trying to do from a startup perspective. We say, we say things like we're, you know, to quote Steve Jobs, we, we're not hiring people for us to tell them what to do. We're hiring people for them to tell us what to do. And I think that, that sort of openness helps to attract that talent and get them on board. Yeah. Anybody want to add to that? Love to. So uh, I have this notion, and I said this once before on a panel, and I got um, lambasted afterwards by someone who did not agree, but um, I'm not sure if I used the right word there, but that, that the young American worker with ambition is not, their American dream isn't our parents' American dream. It isn't 30 years at Ford and a pension and an early retirement. It's not, they don't, it's not their, their approach to the next journey of their life after education, whatever level it is, isn't like, I'm going to go get my 30-year job. It's, I'm going to build a career and it's going to have um, it's going to have fits and starts. It's going to have, it's going to be a journey. I'm going to do multiple things. I'll probably have some changes. I just feel like that's the new the new desire, and I think the startup ecosystem is the, is the perfect opportunity for that. So when I think about um, recruiting people, I'm ex extremely explicit about what that journey is gonna be at a startup. I ask people questions like, can you commit five to seven years of your 30 to 40 years of working here? Um, can you work really hard and have great days and hard days, but leave with like, you know, an incredibly compressed, but you know, very dense amount of learning um, in that time period. Because we're going to do something. We're going to exit or we're going to not, or we're going to, there's, there's going to be a change. This isn't, we're not here for 30 years in a pension. We're here for rapid, massive growth. Um, and then the next thing. And so I try to, I try to look at people and say, I, I mean, we as a business will give you the infrastructure and the framework to be your best self at whatever we're asking you to do, whether it's, an, which is, whether it's engineering or product marketing or whatever it is. Um, and we're going to give you like all sorts of opportunity to be creative and to be resourceful and to solve problems and to contribute at a super high level. Um, and I need you to be really, really, really clear that your expecta the expectation is that like it will end at some point. <laughs> it might end with you. you know, my business was acquired last year and 50 employees got 50 great jobs in another place and it was awesome. But our journey ended, it was over. Um, and they got to leverage the experience that they gained in that super dense amount of time, a super dense experience to go get the next great thing. And so my, my approach to recruiting is like, we're gonna give you this awesome platform to go do your next thing. 
Um, hopefully that's be entrepreneurial again, but um, it's going to be um, it's going to be rich in lessons learned. Yeah. So how important is culture? I know Scott mentioned mission, but how important is culture in terms of attracting talent? And then how does that over, uh, fit into the overall definition of cultures of innovation? Because like you said, this generation of employees are looking to work not only on a mission, but somewhere that's innovative. So how, do, how are you thinking about that, Courtney? So I think that it's really critical in terms of retention. If you're talking about culture, you're talking about your mission, and we're also a mission-driven organization, right? So that's something that, you know, that plus having a consumer app really fuels the interest in the candidates coming in. But what keeps them there is that our commitment to our mission permeates our entire culture. Right, so it is part of every decision that we make, that we are focused on our customer, that we're focused on our end user, on providing access to information ed and education. And that's, you know, it permeates all of our business decisions and it permeates all of the decisions that we make related to our culture, who we hire, who we keep, who we promote, how we, you know, engage our employees. So I think that's a critical piece is if you decide that something is important to you as a company, make sure that that flows through all of the business decisions that you make, whether it's related to your go-to-market strategy or whether it's related to how you engage your employees. So, Ryan, how do you stay close enough to your culture to make sure it's the culture that you wanted to have when you started Timbo? <clears throat> well, you know, real quick, as far as culture goes, like, I, I believe you have to be controversial in some way uh, to be n noticed. Uh, all of our, I mean, we don't do any, we don't hire recruit, have outside recruiters, like, you know, candidates are coming to us because, um, you know, it's, it's known that, you know, hey, I'm an engineer, I, I'm a software, I believe that uh, the software devs should rule the roost in a software company, and I'm un unapologetic about that. If you're a sales guy and you're coming, like, understand, that's the way it's going to be. We're not a sales-led company. And so... Um, that's going to turn off some people. It's going to turn on some people. And, and like, to that me, that turns me off, man. I'm a sales guy. Yeah, I mean, there you go. So don't come. So don't come, and I'm cool with that. <laughs> no job for you. Yeah. I know. I see. <laughs> no, I, you know, it, uh, bottom line, though, to me is like, be notable. Um, you know, you have to usually be controversial to be notable. Uh, reminds me of like when Elon took over Twitter, like, you know, he fired half the people, another third of the people quit because they hated his thing, you know, the way he was going about it. But he was clear what he was going to do, and he did it quick, you know, so. I think that that's, um, there's a strong culture there, whether you agree with it or not. It's, it, was, it wasn't, uh, you know, like wishy-washy what he was going after. Yeah, so, uh, Scott, the idea of culture leaders, though, those people who are the ambassadors of the culture, right? Of course, you want all your employees to be that way. But how do you train up people when you bring them on board so that the culture is, is, is part of that on, onboarding process? And then how do you keep reinforcing that culture that retains talent? Yeah, um, maybe just a word on, on what we do with our new hires. So um, we've built a, a, an orientation program. Every six weeks we run it. Our last one we had 10, uh, 10 new hires in it. Um, we don't, you know, we, the smallest has been four. So you've got a group, a, a sort of cohort there of, uh, of new employees that get to experience each other. And we bring them in uh, to Cleveland and we bring all of our leadership team, anybody in the company is welcome back to sit in on the orientation a, another time and contribute. Uh, we expose team members to each leader in the organization and each sort of, you know, department in the organization. And that, it, the feedback we get from that is phenomenal. It is, you know, we get a pulse of who you are, what you are. Yes, it's consistent with what you told us during the, told me during the hiring process. Um, and so we, so we look to sort of plug them in and tap them into that process early. And we see, we see real rewards and dividends in that. But we also do regular check-ins. That's the other key is to make sure that, uh, you know, is our culture, you know, let's do honest assessment. We do, we do engagement surveys to sort of understand our employee sentiment. But bigger than that is, does the mission hold true? Are, are we living the values daily? Are you contributing? Are you, do you see a path to your contribution to the value? So um, I think it's just, it's just that sort of environment of bringing the team together and valuing the diversity of opinion and, and valuing recurring opinion. Yeah, Courtney, you mentioned something about culture in the green room. I know you want a piece of this. Well, <laughs> A, a brief culture. Um, no, I think something that is really resonant about what Scott is saying is it's the intentionality that you have to go about it with. And, you know, when I was at Lyft, we had a COO who used to say that your culture is your last 50 hires, 
which, you know, it was thought, and at that point in time, you know, we were in this, we were onboarding 50 employees a week at that point in time. And so it really was this place where our culture was sort of ever evolving and always shifting, and that wasn't always a good thing. And so what I really appreciate about what Scott's saying is the intentionality about keeping your culture the way that you want it to be really needs to be at the forefront of your mind when you're creating any of these employee programs and in particular your onboarding, right? It really pays to pay attention to folks in their first 90 days because that that is the thing that kind of permeates them in, in thinking the way that you want them to in order to help the company thrive. All right, this is a moment of keeping it real, guys. All right, any time in your career where you were part of a company or led a company where you feel like you let the culture get away from you? Keep it real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we uh, my first startup journey, um, co-founded Vox Mobile in 2006, and we had 250 people at one point, um, and we never thought about culture. I was terrible at it. I mean, I, we, like, day to day, I just, our approach to culture was work really hard and good things will happen. And like, we'll worry about HR and culture stuff when we're bigger and like we get to 25 million. And so, you know, I, I, I mean, we, in our culture, and culture happens, it's, it's accidental or purposeful, it's, it happens. It's like business operating systems, they happen whether you know it or not. And so at one point we sat around and said, man, our culture is like, create a budget, work really hard, miss some numbers, let people go, create a budget, work really hard. And like people fall into this cycle and it was like, that's a stressed place for a while. Um, and we had to be like incredibly like thoughtful and introspective about how we were going to get how we were going to change that. And I mean, it felt like a massive failure because for years we hadn't thought about it. And then we sit in a room like, oh my god, like what, we like we've missed this completely. Um, and I look I look back at it now like every time I think that something's too fluffy and like we're we're, we're being too easy and or or or, 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 or we're, we're we're just not just working hard. Um, uh, and just getting through stuff. I, I look, look, look back at that time, and say I missed that. That was a complete failure, and um, you know we have an opportunity. You know, we want to do it better this time. Anybody else have thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would just maybe just add to that, Gerald. I mean, it's a great point. I think what you what you do is you look back at those times. So the answer to the question is yes, you know, unfortunately. Um, and as you look back at it, it's, the the warning signs were there. We missed signals. Um, we stayed, you know, in some, some ways we deviated from who we are and what we wanted to be, and other times we held too firm to what we thought we were and wanted to be and didn't make change. So the signs are there, and I think it ties back to, you know, being open, transparent, and having good communication as a leadership team to say, you know, just check in. we got to check in on this and do an evaluation on a regular basis. Can, can I make one more point here? So the, the, this is so hard for, for early stage startups, particularly those that are like, 10, 50, 20, 100 people, because you often have some incredible performers that are incredible at their job, their best sales performer, your best engineer, they're just awesome, but they're terrible for your culture. They're literally ruining it from the inside out. Um, they're bad to people, or they're bad to customers, or they're bad to themselves, um, and it's really hard to make the decision to move on from that, because it's like, wow, they're performing, that person crushes quota. I don't care, everyone else just, it's everyone else's problem to get along with them, but like, that, that, it is so hard. And like, it's one of the reasons why we hit a ceiling in some cases and don't move beyond it and don't go to that next stage of growth because we lack the courage really to probably to make those tough cultural decisions. And I say that from very direct experience many times. Um, uh, so anyway, just want to make that point. Yeah, uh, great point. And so I'm going to come to you, Rye, and then to Courtney. Um, our friends on the previous panel about life sciences, one of the struggles that they're having is finding leaders, entrepreneurs, to commercialize all of this research that's happening within these institutions. Let's talk about, from a startup founder perspective or a startup executive perspective, how are you guys thinking about identifying and then cultivating entrepreneurial propensities and talents when you spot it in your company that says, oh my goodness, not only do they have the hard skills to do their job, but they have the mindset, the problem solving, that um, grit that would make for a great founder. When you see that, what do you tend to do with that? Start with you, Rock. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, <clears throat> for one, I think that the, the challenge is there's not many free radical entrepreneurs in any ecosystem that are like ready to go, except for in San Francisco, maybe New York, you know, like there are people ready to go at all times at San Francisco to like start a, or, you know, in the Valley to start a company. They 
they have mentors that have been telling them to do it for five years, and then the opportunity pops. Like I, you know, I, I looked at uh, you know UC's list of thing, you know technologies they're looking to, and like I'm just like, there's nobody like, there's nobody I could even know. There's disconnectedness, right? Where their stuff isn't my stuff. If they were a list of software projects, maybe I could think about it, but. Um, it, it goes back to my earlier statement where the founder is the hardest of the, uh, you know, I mentioned like ICs. Wow, this is crazy right there. Yeah. <laughs> we're, seeing a, we're seeing another presentation right in front of us. It, yeah. In warp speed. Um, <laughs> all right, I'll try not to look at yeah. it. But, uh, um, you know, I mean, again, I think we've got great individual contributors, but founder is the top of the startup food chain, right? That's the hardest thing to have. Um, ready to go. And so, I mean, me personally, I, I, I'm starting a venture fund in Cincinnati. I'm trying to raise 20 million bucks, by the way. If, uh, we're doing it under, I guess, 506C, so we're allowed to talk about that. Um, and, uh, you know, we put a million bucks in, me and my, my co-founder for the fund, and, like, uh, I have no idea if we're going to do, if we're going to um, be able to achieve, if we're going to raise any money, because, like, it's brand new to us. Like, we've always been on the, on the founder side of things. But you know, it's it's worth trying. It's worth failing. Um, and my goal with that that whole thing, though, is to to help. You know, it's going to be Cincinnati oriented. I want to bring twenty other entrepreneurs through the journey that I've gone through. And that's the way I see it. Is if I can if I can do you know re repeat help help twenty other people repeat what I did, I can uh, retire happy. And it might take me twenty years to get there, but. Um, it's, I mean, it's a, the, the curriculum to be a successful tech startup founder with fund, I mean, just talk about fundraising. You don't learn about fundraising until you do it, you know, and you, and you go get destroyed in San Francisco. Like, um, you know, like we, we need to get more people into that. Uh, as far as fostering team members re related to that, to me, it's just like, it's, it's kind of going to happen. If, you know, most, most, most of our employees are, don't care about the stock options we give them. The ones that do, um, you know, I'm going to definitely look at them differently. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily think that the idea of free radical and free radical entrepreneurs is a great thing because my experience in San Francisco was that we ended up with a lot of folks running around like with solutions, looking for a problem, and not really being, you know, thoughtful around what they were trying to do with that energy and great ideas. I also think it's really critical for growth in a company at any stage to encourage entrepreneurial mindset and innovation because companies at all stages are still looking for growth. And growth doesn't come organically as easy as it quote unquote used to. It comes from innovative thinking. It comes from pushing the envelope. And so you sort of do want to cultivate, even if you're not looking to create entrepreneurs within an ecosystem to go out and create startups, you know, within this community, you're still looking for that entrepreneurial mindset within your organization because that's what's going to push you forward. That's what's going to propel your growth. Yeah. Anybody else want to shot at this? I mean, I just respond like, uh, to me, if you're going to raise money for an idea, you need a founder. If you, if you have a, I mean, it's ideal that you have a founder who's done it at least once. I don't care if they failed, that's, that's okay. But like, at the end of the day, that CEO with the money and the board and, and like the responsibilities of that, um, I just, I, I think we have, a, we give a lot, of, way too much money in our ecosystem to people who aren't really ready for that challenge yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so when you talk about entrepreneurial propensity, like we, most founders, I'd say, what you do have with the free radical startup folks in San Francisco is intentionality about I want to be a, I want to be a founder of an, of an entrepreneurial business, not I found a problem or I don't want people to tell me what to do um, or, you know, I like, like we, we, we have a lot of like founding stories that kind of stumble into it and then struggle a bit because they didn't, there's no entrepreneurial tooling. There's not, there's not, a, there hasn't been historically a lot of education around how to do it. Um, so I think that, you know, success will breed success and we have to make sure we try to keep folks that do have entrepreneurial propensity here and try to nurture that across, you know, their networks. Um, but it, there's a, I mean, the, the, the chasm between the amount of people walking around in San Francisco uh, that want to find a problem because they just want to be a startup founder for things other than reason is dr massive compared to like the people in our region, that's, there's just less people, but in our region who like kind of accidentally become a founder and then need the support to, 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 to create the propensity to do it again and again and again. Yeah. If I may just respond, you know, I, I think that's actually the 
proof why you need to encourage entrepreneurial thinking, even at an organization who's operating at scale, right, or who is in scale-up mode, because th there isn't like a founder boot camp, or there probably is, but, you know, <laughs> who knows if it's actually worth it. You know, that's how folks actually get their, you know, they earn those chops, is by finding a way to exercise that mindset and exercise that propensity within an organization, and then you know maybe they are more successful and they go out and try and fundraise. And it goes back to intentionality, yeah. it, the culture you're building in which to in which to promote that environment, right? Yeah, and so our life sciences folks, I mean, we we have uh, something like that brewing in Columbus. Cover my meds, so started by Matt Scantlin, yeah. sells to McKesson, and then we have sort of a cover my meds mafia, like the PayPal mafia. There are a lot of people who are coming out of co Cover My Meds, but to Rye's point, they are starting companies that are very adjacent to Cover My Meds. They're not jumping from a software company and starting a life sciences company, right? So for our life sciences folks, or if you're looking for folks like that, we have a great company in Columbus, Forge Biologics. I expect they're going to spin out a lot of entrepreneurs that are life sciences focused. All right, let's talk about investor talent. We talked about talent that you want to attract into your company. We talked about developing founder talent within your company. But in order to truly have an innovative ecosystem, you need talented investors. All right? Let's talk about how, as an ecosystem, right, we need to be thinking about investor talent and honing that talent. How do they tolerate risk? Because you cannot have innovation without risk tolerance. So I'll start with Scott and then move on down. Thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, definitely agree. I mean, you cannot have innovation without, um, without, uh, without a desire to be risky and to, and to excel and move ideas forward. Um, you know, after, at the end of the day, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention. So um, that environment uh, certainly gives, gives rise to that. Um, but it also doesn't mean, um, you know, I mean, we've seen companies that are well-funded um, be out-innovated by those that, that, that are not. Um, so it doesn't mean uh, grow at all costs. It doesn't mean, uh, it's, it, to us, it means stay in your swim lane. To us, it means focus on discipline and focus on, um, you know, the, the metrics that matter. And I, you know, we've been successful in, just finished out a, a Series B round, been successful in in attracting a couple new investors, and I think what we're looking for there is additional thought, additional leadership, additional perspective, and um, if you value those things, then I think you'll be able to attract the right sort of right sort of talent from an investor perspective. And I think like-mindedness find like finds like-mindedness. Um, I, so there's like a chicken and the egg problem, right, with founders and investors, and I've just taken the approach in my mindset that uh, it's on the responsibility of the founders to be great, and then we'll get great investors as a result of that. I mean, they're obviously, they're everywhere and they can invest in you, but I think, I think we, more so than I wanna say we have a problem with not having great investors in our region, I wanna say we have, we don't have great founders in our region. And I know it's kinda like, I'm picking on myself, I'm trying to pick on myself in this regard. Um, and I, just, I mean, again, I, I just see it, there's like Silicon Valley speed that a lot, of these, a lot of our people don't move at. You know, there's the ambition level, that, you know, uh, confidence uh, levels that, a lot of our founders fail to hit those marks. Um, so, I mean, I don't, I don't know that there's a, um, an investor, a lack of investment capital problem in Ohio compared to the amount of great founders in Ohio. And so, again, my goal is to try to help address that to the, to the extent I can, but, you know. Yeah, all right, I, so I think we are extremely underrated as a region, and I'll say Midwest, and we'll talk about Ohio, as it relates to investor talent. I think this is the moment for Midwest Ohio-based investors to like rule the roost. We've had, and I agree, Ryan, with a, a, so much about the, the talent side. We, 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 have, we have had a Midwestern spirit of investment that is, was looked down upon for a while, a Midwestern approach to investment that was looked down upon for a while, for a long time. We were laughed at to some degree. I have a bunch of investor friends in this room 
who've um, you know, not, been able, not participated in deals because they weren't invited into syndicates because they weren't th thought of as real investors. And those folks have um, portfolios that are outperforming you know, some of the other portfolios right now because, just of, the, because of the approach to invest. So, so I think, I think like the grit that it takes to be from Ohio and in, mid, in the Midwest and be in this type of environment, um, combined with like this, the general approach, not a grow at all cost approach, but like a build sustainable businesses that have unit economics that are like real and can really go do something and can like recycle talent and capital in an appropriate way. I think that's, that's like been rooted in our investor principles or like tenants for a long for a long time and like that's now's the moment shout out all you investors out there hey joe how you doing um now's the moment like to, to prove it was right and i i i, I my bet is that it was right and i think we have a tremendous tremendously talented group of folks specifically here in cleveland specifically here in in, in ohio and the midwest um that have a great opportunity to drive to, to drive forward if we can attract more great founders um to to move fast yeah, I mean, I think when I think about risk tolerance, right, the, the risk tolerance both, you know, the risk tolerance for investment in Silicon Valley was really driven by this competition, both by investors to invest in the right companies and also for investment. And that isn't always the best, you know, setup for making good, you know, risk appropriate decisions, where I do think that Ohio has a much more measured approach, I guess, to risk tolerance, which you know I think we're seeing is, has played out a little bit better. Yeah, so I want to, anybody else want a, another shot at that? No, you guys don't want to touch that, huh? Yeah, okay, we'll stay away from that. All right, so uh, innovation is all about shifting paradigms. This is off the topic of talent. I just wanted to sneak this in there. Because if in, uh, Ohio is gonna lead in innovation, I think we also need to lead in models startup formation, types of startups, funding options, types of business models, right? So how can we begin to think about shifting paradigms within our startups and creating a new way of doing startups? Whether that's how the startup is formed, whether that's how the startup is funded, or whether that's even the business models for how we tend to generate revenue. What are your thoughts on that? I'll go again. Go ahead. <laughs> so I, th I, th I think it starts with um, participating in some of the newer trends that we maybe, so while I talked about, I think in, uh, in, uh, investor talent's amazing. I do think we've like been a little too slow as regionally in Ohio to like accept some of the newer trends that you can invest in. So like we're not a region that invests in a lot of marketplaces. Uh, we don't have a lot of venture studios happening at the corporate level. Some, but like we let a lot of that venture money leave the state. Todd Federman and I talk about this a lot, right? Like, we, like we, like, and so I think I think we need to like, like chase down the paradigm changes that are already happening and be willing to be a bit more risk tolerant to jump into those. It's not all about just like B two B SaaS and like med, 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 medical startups. There's a lot of other stuff out there that's doing that, that, that's that's creating a lot of great value. I think like once we accept that we should chase down those newer trends and we should participate in that, then it'll, that, that will like ignite or instigate or inspire us to like think about how do we become the change? How, how, how do we be the, the region that thinks about investing in marketplaces, which 10 years ago, it, it, was, it would be crazy to think that you can invest in marketplaces. Now they're popping up all over the place. So I think, um, I just think we need to like accept that we can take our approach to investing, our methodical, thoughtful approach to investing and apply it to new areas. And then that will instigate the, or allow us to be thoughtful about inspiring the next wave? I think we can think a little bit differently about compensation, in particular the concept of equity compensation, which you know was sort of the, is still in a lot of ways, sort of the bread and butter of startup comp, right? You bring somebody on maybe at a lower base salary with the promise of this equity payout, and I don't think equity holds the same weight as it does, or maybe it did 10 years ago. And so we need to be a little bit more, and we can be a little bit more flexible in terms of how do you give somebody the promise of the payout and the reward for the hard work that they're gonna put in on the startup with, you know, maybe by doing something a little bit differently without like maybe a traditional equity grant. Okay, so we only have a couple minutes left. We're gonna wrap. Is there anything that you really, really, really wanted to talk about that I haven't asked about yet? Any thoughts on that? Let's cover remote work. I was say, are you gonna ask the question? About ah, good point. All right, how many of you in the audience would work for a company that required you to be in the office five days a week? Okay, we got a couple of hands, couple of hands. How many people work for a company that does that now? Meaning there's no re work, a remote work option. 
Okay, a couple. All right, so how <laughs> has remote work impacted this whole world of attracting and retaining talent? We'll just go down the line. So with, um, with the pandemic and the shift to remote work, we, we at Overdrive did not shift our recruiting strategy to 100% remote, which I know a lot of companies did. And so because of that, kind of coming out of the pandemic and returning to the office, we returned in a hybrid model, so we're two days a week in the office. And that, I think, I, I think that has helped us to balance our desire for collaboration, our desire for culture, our ability to be intentional about building our culture and onboarding our folks and collaborating in the way that we want to, and still providing that flexibility. The reality is, I think employees want the flexibility. We want the balance in a lot of ways, but that's not necessarily conducive to building the kind of cultures that thrive. There's a reason that we all worked in the office, you know, prior to the pandemic. So I think that we've been able to strike a, the right balance, and it also comes back to the intentionality piece. We wanted to keep that option of being hybrid, and so that's, we, we tailored our recruiting strategy accordingly. There's no doubt, I mean, it's, that it's bas be basically impossible to recruit a team of incredibly talented folks to do very nuanced or discrete jobs um, uh, without offering some level of like, work where you wanna work type. There's just no doubt, like that's just where we're at. Um, I'm, you know, I, I, I wish everyone would sit right around me in a big circle, uh, with me in the circle, uh, me part of the circle every day for nine hours a day and put our heads down at work. Like I just like, I just, I just like miss those days. Shout out 1999. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but there's no doubt it's changed. Like it's just, we, it's changed. And, and, um, and so we have to accept that. Uh, I have a massive belief that you need to be in the room when it happens, that like these great moments of inspiration and ignition happen when people collaborate and um, and openly um, constructive and debate in ways of debate, um, uh, but like we, we have to build we have to build around that. If we want to get people to come to work to, to work for you, you have to offer them. I uh, have to meet them where they're at. So I, I think that this you know hybrid's the, the buzzword here. You know, the, whether it's you're going to be in the office three days a week or two days a week, or I, I think that's a start. But like I think I, I just I, I think we have to we have to come to grips with that. There is people should be together in some cases, and that we should figure out mechanisms to allow them to be super productive when they're not. <clears throat> when I started Astronomer in 2015, we had a bunch of VFAs that ended up coming. I know you guys have VFAs here in Cleveland too. Um, we had four tables with four seats in each table, you know, like uh, like uh, picnic table style tables practically. And all, we had four, I had 14 team members. We were all in a little circle. We had that circle, you know, and this was 2015. Uh, I, I think that if you're a first time founder, you should do, you should not do remote. It's, it's, it's an advanced management challenge. Yeah. Uh, I think that one of the reasons why big companies are saying back to work is because it's a it's a it's an advanced management challenge, and they usually have, eh, you know, a lot of middle managers that aren't so great. Um, I th I think if you're if you're a second time founder, maybe you could pull it off from the beginning, but it's definitely like a tech. It's you know you better have you know, it's like software engineers and um, man, I, I if I could if I could you know wave a magic wand, I would definitely want all my team at Tembo to be, it you know in the, in the same spot, but. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just, I think, I think it's, I, I think that it's the right thing for, for like, um, experienced founders to go ahead and maybe try to play that thing, but don't do it if you're brand new. Just get, collect some people nearby. Scott, close us out. Uh, I'm watching that clock, but it's going the wrong, going the wrong great, way now. All, all, great, all great comments, and I, I totally agree. I would say intentional, back to intentional, it matters. I, I think that collaboration, when touching one another, when in the same room, being able to look at each other, be able to draw on a whiteboard, it, it matters. Um, it, we also have to recognize, particularly when you're doing software development, it, you know, our engineering community likes to put on the headphones and they're, they're more productive potentially and not in the office. So we have to also embrace that. Look, it's evolving. We're learning too as leaders and founders. We're, we're learning too. And um, well, it's going to be a fun journey to see how this plays out. All right. Excellent job, panelists. Let's give them a big round of applause. All right. And that's it for us. Thank you guys so much. We appreciate it.